Welcome everybody. My name is Amy Schultz um, and I am the co-lead for the Community Engagement Corps for the M Lead Environmental Health Science Center. I want to introduce my co-conspirator over here, Barbara Israel, who um, co-leads the, um, the Community Engagement Corps um, with me. Uh, we're really delighted to see so many people here in the audience today and want to welcome those of you who are joining us electronically for this uh, webinar. Uh, we have about, at this point, about 20 people who are joining us, so we're really delighted. Um, and I want to welcome everyone. This is the second in a series of, of um, seminars that we're hosting as part of the MLEAD Center that are featuring community and academic partnerships that are doing work around environmental justice and environmental health issues. We're really delighted to be hosting a team from North Carolina here who not only um, braved last month's hurricane, but this last week's snowstorm uh, to get here. So um, we're really delighted that they were able um, to join us. Um, those of you who are on the webinar, um, if you have any, any uh, challenges um, listening in, go ahead and type a note into the, um, the notes section um, so that we can see that on this end. And as we get to the end of the talk, there'll be an opportunity for a conversation and for you to submit questions um, in the same manner. Um, and as well as those um, who are in the room here. I'm going to introduce Marie O'Neill, who is the lead for the Integrated Health Sciences um, uh, Core, which is co-organizing um, these seminars with us, and she is going to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Amy, and welcome everyone on the webinar and in the room. Um, so I'm very delighted to introduce our two speakers, Kemp Burdett, um, Who's speaking first, actually? We're gonna. We're, it'll it'll be a, a co-presentation. So I'll start with my introduction of Kemp. So he has a really wonderful, interesting background with training in geology, history, and public administration. He is a U.S. Navy search and rescue swimmer. So he's the guy you want when you're on the water. Um, was a Fulbright scholar and served in the Peace Corps. And his current position is the Cape Fear River Keeper. Um, and then Jane Hoppen is an environmental epidemiologist. She is an associate professor at North Carolina State University, has been there for the past five years. Previous to that, she was a researcher at the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, working on the ag agricultural health study cohort. She's the principal investigator of the Gen X exposure study, which we'll learn about. And she also has a project on pesticide exposures in Costa Rica. Her training is in epidemiology and environmental health from UC Davis and from Harvard. So we're really delighted to have both of them here and please begin. All right, thanks. So um, uh, this is the first time we've done this. So um, thanks for having us. And I'll also mention that I'm deputy director of the P30 Center at NC State. Um, so, uh, part of the Center for Human Health and the Environment. Um, we're going to first start with, like, introducing who we are. Um, so, like, as Marie said, I'm an environmental epidemiologist. I deputy director of the um, Center for Human Health and the Environment. And part of our mission is to, um, uh, is to, like, learn how to be on TV better. Um, <laughs> is to, uh, Part of our mission is to help respond to emerging environmental health threats um, that happen in North Carolina. So, um, so I was just uh, like taking Spanish in summer school and working on uh, my R24 in Costa Rica uh, when the news started coming out about Gen X. And I was like, what's Gen X? And so. Um, so that's how I kind of learned about Gen X. And then, you know, but how do we, how do we make it happen? Um, it took some other steps. So I'll let Kemp introduce himself and then we're gonna talk about a little background and then we'll switch back to the exposure study. Yeah, so uh, in, for the introduction, the KK Riverwatch, we're an environmental grassroots nonprofit. So probably a lot like groups you have around here um, that, you know, Work. Uh, we work on a watershed basis, so uh, our our mission includes protecting water quality in the Cape River Basin, which is fairly large. But um, we are we are not at all a uh, a uh, 
a, a group that understands a lot about the epidemiological world or anything like that. And uh, so I kind of go to Um, so this is where we're going to be talking about, uh, which I think is, is important to kind of set the stage. This is the, the Cape Fear River Basin. This is a map of North Carolina. It kind of runs right up the middle there. It's the largest watershed in our state, about 9,000 square miles, a little bit bigger than the state of New Jersey. Uh, throughout the watershed, supplies about 1.5, maybe a little bit more than 1.5 million people with drinking water. Uh, it ends uh, in a about a 25 mile long estuary down here, uh, which is an important area for seafood and recreation and things like that. Uh, and it's a fairly industrialized river kind of throughout clustered in, in sections. Um, and, and this is what brought us together, <laughs> I guess. This was uh, a paper published by Detlef Canapi at, at NC State, building on research uh, that two EPA um, scientists uh, had published looking at um, water downstream of uh, a manufacturing facility called Kimmores on the Cape Fear River. Uh, and this paper uh, was picked up by a reporter with our local newspaper, Star News. And this reporter saw, saw this paper and looked at it and kind of, uh, I have since talked to this reporter and he said, well, oh, you know, it was a slow news day. And so I, I picked it up and I was kind of reading and I didn't really understand it that much, but I got contacted the researcher and, and we did a little story on it. Um, and, you know, he, the, the writer had no earthly idea of what was going to happen uh, next. And uh, Dr. Kanapi had been trying for some time to bring this issue into the public eye because I think, you know, he felt like it was a very important issue. But uh, what, what ended up happening was this, um, you know, there was a story and then in rapid succession, multiple other stories. Um, and, you know, our community kind of just exploded in, in concern and concern and, you know, nobody really knew what this stuff was. Nobody knew what it meant. Um, and uh, nobody knew what PFAS compounds were. Nobody knew what Gen X was. Um, and that kind of started this whole ball rolling. Um, probably a lot of people in this room understand very well what PFAS compounds are. I can tell you that um, in, in our community, not very many people at all did. Um, and so, you know, we started doing what everybody starts doing, which is Googling. Uh, and we pretty quickly um, came across the story of Parkersburg, West Virginia, which is a, a pretty well-known um, PFAS contamination story and, and people got you know even more concerned based on on you know the, the results of that very large health study down there. Um, PFAS compounds are made uh, and, and they're used in some of the things that we we all probably have on right now our our raincoats and our uh, you know Gore-Tex shoes and boots uh, and, and the pants that we put our breakfast in. Um, and then, you know, also in firefighting phones, uh, which are used especially on fuel fires um, and used in training facilities and things like that all over the country, uh, Air Force bases and airports and, and things that make their way into, into our water. Gen X was the compound that kind of broke the story in, in our area. Um, of course, it's, it's just one of them, 10X was the compound that was used to replace uh, PFOA in the manufacture of Teflon. Um, and that, that was required because of a, of a consent order signed between US EPA and uh, <coughs> DuPont later amended to include Tim Ward, uh and, and a couple of other uh, manufacturing facilities. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, understanding that these companies were being continue to produce these very profitable uh, materials, but that they were now, based on the health study in, in West Virginia, required to replace uh, that eight chain compound with a shorter six chain compound that was, uh, which was, you know, the company claimed uh, had a shorter half-life, stayed in our bodies less time, uh, and was 
more easily broken down in the environment. But in general, these Amazing. compounds don't break down very quickly at all and are extremely persistent. And one of the reasons I thought it was going to break down more easily is this ether group. So it broke up the uh, perfluoro chain. So the ether was supposed to break down more rapidly in the environment and have shorter half lives. So the, uh, that was one of the, so Gen X replaced PFOA. And so that was why they were thinking about that. Okay. Yeah. But pretty quickly, you know, our community started to say, well, you know, if the, if the half life is shorter, does it really matter if you drink water every day? Our, our water system, the, the, the concern was that our drinking water uh, provider, which is called the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority, CFPUA, we'll probably mention that a few more times, has a very advanced water treatment plant, one of the most advanced treatment plants in North Carolina, but it did absolutely nothing to touch uh, these compounds that were identified by uh, Dr. Kanaki. So, you had the same levels coming out in your treated drinking water as you had going in, in your raw, raw water. And so the the how quickly this compound would move out of your system didn't make any difference at all to us because we all knew that we were drinking it every single day. So we're kind of filling the res reservoir every time we took a drink of water. Um, and that paper didn't just identify Gen X, it identified six other uh, compounds, which there was even less known about. Gen X was at least a commercially produced product. There were at least analytical standards. Uh, there had been a number of um, Toxic Substance Control Act filings made by the company about Gen X. And so it, it was, and it was addressed in that EPA consent order uh, because EPA knew that the company was making that move towards Gen X. And so, uh, Gen X had a name that was really easy to remember uh, that everybody could say, um, and and you know even today people talk about Gen X rather than talking about Gen X and all of these other um, kind of emerging contaminants. Uh, we don't you don't call them emerging contaminants. Newly identified. I use newly identified, but yeah. Because they're not really emerging, right? Gen X has been around since since you know the '80s at least. Uh, and Gen X was just a small uh, percentage of these PFAS compounds that were actually found in the water supply. Um, and this is a slide that just kind of gives an indication of just how many of these things are out in the environment, how many of these are produced, um, possibly over 3,000 uh, on the global market. And so, uh, and, and almost nothing understood about most of them. So just to quickly kind of give you the background, um, and then I'll turn it over to Jane to talk about the study. Um, so th th this is a DuPont plant, not, not in West Virginia. This is a DuPont plant in Cape Fear began uh, releasing Gen X as a byproduct in the 80s. So after the company, I'm sorry, before the company was ever considering phasing out PFO or PFOS, they were producing Gen X as a byproduct of other manufacturing processes. Uh, so the, the way it's kind of been explained to me is, is you, you put a number of compounds into a reactor, you apply you know, some catalyst and you, you hope to get out what you want and you're gonna get out a number of other things that you don't want. And those things are gonna be your byproducts and they're released into the environment. Um, and this had been happening for years. We, we found out very quickly uh, after the news broke that this wasn't a new thing. Gen X wasn't a new thing for us. It had been released into our drinking water supply for, for almost 40 years. And so, you know, most of the people in Wilmington had been drinking this for a large portion of their lifetime. Around 2000, um, DuPont begins manufacture of Teflon at the Fayetteville site using C8. Gen X eventually replaces C8. Uh, based on that consent order. And that consent order said, look, you have to recapture 99% of the Gen X you produce for, for resale. So, mm -hmm. so the company agreed and they said, we'll, we'll recapture 99% of the Gen X that we produce to sell to other people while continuing to release Gen X as a byproduct in this other kind of section of the manufacturing process, which is a, um, has been a big, that, that kind of loophole or that attempt at a loophole has been a big part of some of the litigation that's come out of this that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, you know, the 2012 study done by the EPA scientists and followed up on by Dr. Kanapi in 2015, published in 2016, um, 
and so you know now we're here the story is is broken there's a lot of uh additional research going on uh a lot of new compounds identified uh and we're just starting to um kind of take action on some of this this isn't just a mpds discharge issue uh that was where most of the focus of of regulatory actions and, and most of the concern by the community was initially was the, the, the fact that this company was discharging compounds from their from their permitted discharge. That was very quickly shut down by the state. Um, and you know there's a, a lot more research going on. People were looking more and more places. We started to see this in groundwater and well water. Uh, there's a there's kind of a Oh, you, you can't really call it a community, but there are homes around this facility, and those homes started to show uh, the presence of uh, perchlorinated compounds in their well water, uh, even upgradient of, of the plant. Uh, but uh, what people began to realize is, is that it was upgradient groundwater wise, but it was down gradient or, or downwind of the prevailing winds that were carrying. Uh, air emissions from the plant, depositing them on the ground, and then that was then getting into groundwater. Uh, then groundwater was contributing to surface water uh, when the Cape Fear River was losing and, and it was going the other way when it was gaining. Uh, you had airborne pollutants on crops, started to see uh, Gen X and honey. Uh, Gen X has been found in fish tissue. Um, number of private wells contaminated and and the university down in Wilmington UNCW has, has been detecting Gen X and rainwater uh, at the campus there 70 miles of the coastline. So you know very persistent in the environment able to move throughout the environment in a number of different ways um, and kind of just widespread contamination of surface water groundwater um, sediment crops. And, and the ecosystem in general. The big issue, oh, there it is now. Uh, the, the big issue was that there were no health standards for Gen X. So not only did we not know what it was, but we didn't know uh, whether or not it was, you know, how bad it was. We could look at the stories out of Parkersburg and see that the precursors for Gen X were, were very bad. And we knew that this was replacing uh, C8 in the manufacturing process and, and serving all of the same functions. And so, you know, people said, well, logical to think that it might not be the best for us. Um, the North Carolina Department of Human Health and um, our Health and Human Services set an initial level very quickly of about 71,000, uh, which was, you know, orders of magnitude higher than the level that had been set for PFO and PFOS. And people just said, wait a minute, what, what did you base that on? And we started to look and they had based it on studies done by Kim Ors, Um and after a, a fair amount of pressure from from Cape Fear River Watch and other groups, they they drop that number by a factor of 500 down to 140. And so people again are just they're they're kind of losing faith in this in the state, uh, both in DEQ and uh, Department of Health and Human Services to kind of do this in a careful way. Um, People are looking around and seeing other standards that are much lower than ours. Uh, and even now, new guidance was just released by EPA in November. And so just to illustrate that this is a, a kind of a an issue that is evolving today and will continue to evolve. And there's still a lot of unknowns, which makes people scared. So the, the PFOA and the PFOS, the combined uh, regulatory guideline is standing. Yeah, so I do know the answer to this one. So, um, yeah, so that there was only four, so the same four papers that North Carolina had to set a regulatory standard were also what was in the Netherlands. And so, and at some level, they assumed that Gen X was half as toxic as PFOA or PFOS. So that was, but there's a lot more literature behind the PFOA, PFOS numbers. And you probably also know that ATSDR dropped those uh, to like 10 and 14. So um, all these regulatory numbers are moving, which is another challenge in trying to figure out how to talk about this. So 
you know, so imagine this community, you've got this substance that's been found in your drinking water, then you find out that it's been in your drinking water for 40 years, and then you realize that, that nobody knows much about it at all. Uh, and, and, you know, remember that people are making you know, bottles for their children here, and, and they're looking at relatives that have, you know, various health conditions. And, and our community at this point is just in this state of, of near panic. Lots of fear and anger, lots of finger pointing back and forth between, you know, the, the public utility authority who had not announced, uh, you know, as soon as they knew that these compounds had been identified in the water. And so there was this period of time where everybody in town felt the public utility authority was, was trying to hide this stuff from them. They were finger pointing at the governor and at the state DQ um, and, of course, at the company. Uh, and a ton of, of misinformation out there, um, and and just uh, a feeling like, you know, we had no idea what it, what was being done to us. We started to organize pretty quickly, as quickly as we could, seminars, and and we didn't even know, you know, what we knew and what we didn't know. But we started to try to pull together people who who knew about these things. So we pulled together seminars. We brought in Jane and Detlef. Uh, we brought in the, the public utility authority to talk about things, other toxicologists, biologists, uh, advocates, legal experts, and we started to host these uh, community forums, and, and people started to show up in really big numbers. Um, and we just started to try to try to explain what we knew and, and what we didn't know. Um, had a lot of media coverage, and then we started to get a lot of attention, as you can imagine, with close to 300,000 people being extremely concerned about an issue, it started to become kind of politicized uh, and started to get a lot of attention at the General Assembly. Um, lots of Facebook groups formed. Some of these Facebook groups uh, did a really good job of kind of carefully considering what they put out for tens of thousands of people to see. Some of these Facebook groups, you know, didn't, and, and they just put out, you know, misinformation or, or information that they didn't really understand, which kind of added to the sense that, that nobody knew what was going on. Um, several lawsuits were filed. Our organization filed uh, Clean Water Act lawsuits and, and uh, declaratory ruling lawsuits in the state at the state level. Um, there have been class action lawsuits filed. There have been other Clean Water Act lawsuits filed by the public utility. Um, a lot of trips up to the General Assembly to speak at committee hearings and, and uh, things like that. Um, a lot of community meetings, a lot of rallies, a lot of people at the, the city, you know, the courthouse doing rallies. Aaron Brockovich was in town. Um, and, you know, then we started realizing that we still knew very little about how it was impacting us. And, and that was what people wanted to know. And so that's kind of when um, Jane comes in. Um, well, you know, I'll really quickly go over this, just kind of wrap up. So, so the, the discharge was stopped very quickly, June of 2017. Um, been a number of injunctions and notice of violations issued against the company by the state. Uh, our lawsuit has resented, resulted in this uh, draft consent order, which is reducing air emissions by about 99% and doing groundwater remediation, uh, water filtration for people on groundwater wells, um, and health studies, toxicology studies, uh, and and this consent order has to be signed by a judge. Still, this just came out about a week and a half ago, um, and then these other lawsuits are still in process. And so, this is something that's still very much unfolding. But we have at least kind of turned the corner from uh, just everything being up in the air to start to try to find solutions. So, and, and a lot of the things on this slide are, are things that, as a scientist. Um, we kind of back away from, right? We don't look at per we don't pull permits and look at them. We don't file notice of violations. We're not suing people. But this is the backdrop that we're working in, and um, a lot of this information that we normally don't gather uh, is very useful to how we might do a study. Um, so, also, what happened when the uh, they said stop discharging Gen X to the water? is they did. So um, this graph is from uh, June to August of 2017. So uh, they stopped discharging 
on uh, June 21st. And you can see, oh, it's, uh, we lost the scale, but um, the triangles are finished water and the circles are, um, are, are water from the river. So you can see that the water treatment plant was not removing any of the chemicals. And then you can see that um, before they turned off the water, the levels was about, were, was about 700 parts per trillion. And that was in 2017. The paper that when they collected the data originally in 2013, the levels were also 700 parts per trillion. So that suggests that potentially that was the exposure, at least for that one now. Um, and you can see that sometimes they discovered new discharges that they uh, brought it down, but it's been below the North Carolina health goal of 140 nanograms per liter um, for a while. So, so levels are coming down, so which is also why we wanted to move fast, right? We don't know anything about the half-life of this chemical. And so um, if you remember your toxicology that uh, five half-lives are believed to be complete elimination. And one of the best estimates for potential half-life was 30 days. So we have like five months maybe to see it. Um, so some of the potential uh, health effects, um, so thinking about half-life, this is, and so this is part of the challenge is the half-lives differ by <laughs> chemical, C8 is about four years, PFOS is about five, um, PFHXA is about 32 days, so one month. Um, PFOA in humans is in years, in female rats in hours, and in male rats is in days. So probably even differences by gender. And so um, no real guess on to what was in people. Um, and the animal data weren't very informative. <coughs> and there's the, the, most of the data we know about PFOA comes from this Parkersburg, West Virginia study, the C8 science panel, which included over 45,000 residents of Parkersburg, West Virginia. And this study was con conducted as part of a consent decree. Um, and so it showed that PFOA was associated with elevated cholesterol. And this has been re reproduced in a number of st studies. Um, a pretty rare outcome, ulcerative colitis, um, thyroid disease, hypothyroidism in men and hyper in women, testicular and kidney cancer, as well as pregnancy-induced hypertension. So some rare diseases, some common diseases. Um, and in, uh, in children, we know we've, they've also seen dyslipidemia. Um, there's also a lot of concern about immune function in these chemicals. Um, it may, they may affect vaccine response, or they may influence asthma, renal function, age at menarche, birth weight. Um, and so, but most of the studies have focused on PFOA and PFOS. Um, and most have used biological samples as their marker of exposure. Um, so what, what we as the Center for Human Health and the Environment wanted to know, well, what could we do? What does the community want to know? What can we as scientists offer? And then how can we make this happen? So we took advantage of the NIEHS time sensitive R21 grants program for emerging environmental health threats. This started out as like, how do you respond to the Gulf oil spill or a hurricane? So we had to argue that this, we had to move fast because the chemical was being removed. And if we were gonna catch it, we needed to move fast. Which also means moving fast means that you forge partnerships quickly. And so we knew that there was probably exposure around the plant, but they weren't a group yet. And so how do we look at this? And so, so we, we launched a Gen X exposure study to respond to community concerns. And um, people wanted to know, am I exposed? Is it in my body? Uh, what are the health effects? What predicts it being in my body? But there was no, little or no toxicology data. For many of the chemicals that were detected in the river, they were detected through high resolution mass spectrometry. So um, in an untargeted way, so there's, there are some chemicals for which we have no analytic standards. Um, we have no half-life information for a lot of it. And we had nothing to compare it to. And we wanted a group, we wanted, we wanted to be able to tell people what we found um, and give them some interpretation. So all of these things are like, as we forge ahead with this, we have all these challenges 
are, are still there. Um, uh, so, but people want to know a lot of things. What is it? Where did it come from? How long has this been going on? Has, have, we, have these people been exposed for 40 years? I mean, imagine waking up one day and saying, like finding out that you've been drinking Teflon for 40 years. Um, and probably the levels um, were high, the same level over time, because they were just discharging from production. Um, but there's not good stored samples. We can't recreate the past um, well, because there's not historic water samples back in 1980. You know, what are the health effects? What else is in the water? Is it safe for me, my kids, my dog, my plants, my animals? Can I eat the fish? If you live around the plant, will it affect my property value? If you uh, represent the town of Wilmington, will it affect tourism? All of these things uh, are in that. Um, and so, so we were really able to leverage a lot of the expertise at the Center for Human Health and the Environment. Um, Rob Smart, our center director, is a toxicologist with a lot of interest in uh, toxicokinetic modeling. Katie May is our community engagement core director. So really interested in report back. Detlef Kanapi, the world expert on this topic. And then our, our uh, members at East Carolina University, Jamie DeWitt, one of the few toxicologists in the world who's published on these chemicals. Um, and David Collier, who's a physician, and Suzanne Lee, who's an environmental epidemiologist, who was the president of the North Carolina Public Health Association and knows every health director in a state with 100 counties. So all of these pieces were really critical in thinking about how we were going to make it happen. And everybody was engaged. It's like, all right, what do you need me to do? And so we put together an outline, and we wrote, we wrote a grant in a month. Um, and it, to answer these questions, is Gen X detectable in my body? What predicts Gen X in my body? And are there health effects associated with Gen X? And right now we're, we're talking about Gen X because that was, that was the July topic, Gen X and other PFAS family we built toward. Um, and so like the first community meeting that I went to was in July of 2017. Um, we submitted the grant on August 1st. We were funded November 1st. We collected blood and urine samples from 310 people, November 10th through 12th. Um, we did a lot of chemical analysis. We reported back on the water first, partly so that um, we get our analytic methods up and running. Um, and also that was less scary because people knew that they had, they had these chemicals in the water. And we've just recently done um, the biological report back. Um, so our study design, so in Wilmington, people are exposed through municipal drinking water. So you had to be uh, served by municipal drinking water. So then we could link your address to the water system. And most of the um, addresses were at were served by surface water, but a subset of the town is served by groundwater. And so we could we also had some of those people, but we could know where their water source was because they don't blend. Um, we collected blood, urine, and drinking water samples. We analyzed for Gen X and other PFAS chemicals. Um, <clears throat> we analyzed uh, serum for thyroid function, liver function, and lipids. And we're really committed to report back to individuals and the community. Um, and that is a non-trivial time uh, activity. Um, and um, because you have to do it while your data is still all coming in. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, we'd like to publish this stuff. So you had to live in, be served by the Cape Fear Public Utility for at least a year, so at tw June 2016 backwards, be over five years old. We enrolled up to four people per household, so now we can compare whether people live in the same household, do they have common similar letters. We enrolled both in English and Spanish um, because we had, um, kids like uh there's different consent forms for kids six to ten as 11 and older so we had um so many different consent documents because we have and assent documents and in english and in spanish and there's not enough colors of paper to keep track of all of that um we excluded pregnant women 
because um, we weren't going to get enough of them. And also, if you draw blood from a pregnant woman, it's no longer a minimal risk activity. And for this first, like we wanted to characterize the population. And um, we excluded people who told us that they were <coughs> HIV or Hep C positive. Um, so at the clinic, like I said, we collected blood and urine samples from 310 people in November, 34 new people in May. We had not done really well at recruiting African Americans on our first pass. So we went live November 1st, like, okay, people are interested in study. Kemp, one of the board members of the Cape Fear Public Utility is the president of the NAACP. I went to local links meetings and shared our flyer. We thought we were gonna do really well on recruiting African Americans and we did not. <laughs> And so, um, but we persisted, and um, the woman who is the health director for the NAACP sits on our community science advisory panel, and so we had our first meeting in January, she's like, Jane, we can, I can help you recruit African Americans, and so they were having a health fair in May, and at one point I was like, oh, it's so far behind, but as it turned out, it was six months after the first time, so we could recruit new people, but because we knew the levels would change, we needed some people to compare, so we could bring in old people, and that would let us have not only a comparison sample for our new people, but also let us look at change over time. So by being responsive to the community, we also had an opportunity to have a stronger study design. So, but, we were, at, we were pretty surprised when we were like, wait, we did all of this work because we did very well recruiting Hispanics. Um, so people came in, uh, we collected blood, urine, we administered a questionnaire, and we tried to get complete residential history since 1980. Terrible to self to administer, um, but we tried to get, so we could build a, a water uh, reconstruction address. We measured height and weight, we went to people's houses and collected tap water. We also recorded information on their uh, home filters rather than relying on self-report. So it was just easier to get from an administrator. Um, and so we partnered with the local health department. Well, like we partnered with uh, Cape Fear River Watch. We also have partners with the health department who are really committed to making this happen. And our first sample uh, in November, we actually took over the new Hanover County Health Department for a weekend. We hired the phlebotomists, we ran the lab, but they provided the space. So really important if you wanna process blood samples, you can't do that everywhere. And so even when we, when we were working with the NAACP later, uh, we processed the blood samples at the County Health Department lab facility. Um, so we were able, even though there's some pushback from the Board of Commissioners to do more like big collections at the health department. There's also encouragement, like we still could partner with them for, because um, no one really wants you spinning large numbers of blood samples in their gym. Um, so, so in the NAACP and lots of other partners. So part of our, uh, because we're moving so fast, is like we make friends along the way and we're really kind of building our community uh, collection. And so part of what Cape Fear River Watch did in helping with the data collection is they help with advertising, Facebook pages, blasts to their membership, help with participant recruitment. Um, people called us, we had lots of people calling back but trying, trying to use secure systems. Um, but it was also a way that we could hire people in Wilmington quickly. So we could hire uh, students at UNCW to help with Spanish translation or, or to help with water collection and just use their resources because you guys all know universities don't like quick as an operating principle. And so it made it much easier to connect and also to do a kind of a pop-up event where you needed staffing. And so we, hire, we could hire contract phlebotomists, but then leverage people. Um, and they collect with, help with water collection, assisted with the clinic visits, scheduling, and then following up with participants. Um, because a lot of people, when they started to get letters from us, um, wouldn't call us, they would call the County Health Department or River Watch. And so um, by having a lot of partners, like you don't know who's talking about you, um, and that's probably fine, but um, 
you know, it, it helps us expand our reach. So we mentioned this, we stored samples. Um, Jane, yeah. I just want to announce that we have a hard stop at 110. The instructor for the next okay. class agreed to give us extra time. So okay. um, when we end at 110, if everyone can just leave the class, I just wanted to okay. know our time. So we have about 15. Okay, excellent. Well, I'll try to talk faster. You guys can ask questions. Um, so we have a community science advisory panel, which includes not only Kemp from Riverwatch, but also um, the state epidemiologist, the county health director, the county health communications director, uh, two African American healthcare providers, um, a Spanish speaking social worker. Um, a retired biostatistician statistician from NIH. So we have kind of a diverse population of Wilmington residents. And we use them to give us report information on how to do the report back. So for example, people want, uh, we learned pretty quickly that people wanted to, um, people wanted to know what we knew when we knew it, as opposed to we want to share information when we understand it. Um, it's a little bit of a tenuous situation as a scientist. So, you know, and we've had community meetings to discuss results and working on how to respond to results. And so this, um, so we have a lot of other community partners and we're building them over time. Um, most importantly, if we did not have the partnership with Amanda Boomersheim and the Spanish language program at UNCW, we would not be able to recruit in Spanish because if you want to recruit in another language and with a small portion of the population speaks, you got to have a committed person to help you make that happen. Um, and we're building it over time. Um, all right. So, oh, I guess we're going to go report back a later. So we looked at a number. We looked at a number of different PFAS: 17 chemicals in water, 23 in blood. Um, we reported the water results back in uh, April of 2018. These weren't a surprise. People knew what there were chemicals in their water. Um, but <laughs> it was some level of reassuring because we collected samples from people's kitchen taps, not just relying on what was coming from the county. And so you can see that people who were sourced by groundwater had uh, no GenX. People who were sourced by Cape Fear water ranged from nine to tax to about 100. And this is water from the treatment plant. So we collected samples over about a month. And so we probably captured some of the natural variability. We're actually now working with the utility to share our water results with them so that they can see if there's some aspects of their distribution system that influences um, PFAS levels. Are there PFAS hotspots? Um, that was kind of challenging because I have identified information and distribution information is uh, for water utilities is protected by Homeland Security. So it took us a while to figure out how we could meet in the middle and share. Um, but then we also measured uh, three new chemicals uh, that we didn't have analytic standards, but were much higher on instrument response than Gen X. So this is CFMOA, Napium Byproduct 2, which is an eight carbon compound, and another PFO2HXA. So it's the PF alphabet soup, and I'm not sure we're ever going to be able to, to work with that. Um, so we did these individual uh, result reports back to people. And so for every chemical, this was for water, and we used a similar thing for um, uh, blood. And these are all on our uh, website, so you can see like the letters that people got. Um, they're generic. Um, but so there's a strip plot. Every, every sample that we collected, uh, the triangle is the average. Here, it's the median on the blood. Um, and then green is your value. So this person is a little bit above 50 parts per trillion. And for water, we can report health values if there were any existing. Um, <coughs> all right, so that there. So here's what we measured. We monitored for 23 different chemicals in blood. The, Left-hand column is newly identified, Gen X, Napium byproduct 1, 2, 4. Um, and then the right-hand column is what we're calling historically used, but also legacy. Um, we're, we were confident in our methods for 15 different of these chemicals. 
some of them were not optimized or some of them, the short change ones were, are probably gonna be e easier to measure in urine. Um, we also had uh, samples to compare it to, like, so is it gonna be new and different or are we gonna just be like everybody else and we didn't, didn't look? And so we tested 20 samples from women, uh, a study of women aged 30 to 44 from the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area. So this would be women who drank water in the same watershed, but upstream. Um, and 24 samples from Dayton, Ohio, um, with residents who have high PFOS exposure from an Air Force base. And then um, we also compared it to NHANES. So we didn't find Gen X in the samples, and uh, we had really good analytic methods. CDC did a uh, work with the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. They also did not measure uh, Gen X in the blood of people. So Gen X probably has a very short half-life. Um, we also didn't measure these five other chemicals, but we did measure in almost everybody we looked, um, Nafion byproduct 2, which is an eight carbon, uh, PFO4DA, which we detected in tap water at very low levels, PFO5DODA, which we didn't look for in tap water, but we know now that it's in the Cape Fear River, and this chemical called Hydro Eve, which is a carboxylic acid of Nafion byproduct 2. And um, that one we only had, and it looks like another chemical, 6F2S, and we only because we were using this high resolution mass spectrometry, could we separate it out um, from that. And so we did see that in the, when we went back and looked at it in the water. So these are brand new chemicals. We just got analytic standards from the chemical company, which means there's not any animal testing toxicity data available. So how much would we find? Uh, so Nathan by part two is about, the median was about 2.8, uh, PFO4DA about the same, and uh, much lower levels of this other one. Um, but we did not find these chemicals in the blood samples from those two other studies. Um, we did show that uh, for the 44 people who repeated that the levels of these chemicals came down, also levels of hydro Eve came down, but we don't have quantitative numbers. So, so you can see that the levels are dropping. Um, so when we compare them to NHANES, this was the second kind of reveal as we found these new chemicals in your body that no one's ever measured before, but they're coming down. But these chemicals that we know a lot about, you're much higher than the US population. So uh, the white is the NHANES data and the gray is our sample. And if you can see for PFOA, um, the median is four times different uh, for PFOA. Also looks the same for PFHXF um, and PFND. So, so the levels of the legacy or historically used compounds are much higher in Wilmington. And that uh, this is only twice a different, but PFOS is also higher. And we didn't see in the people who lived around the chemical plant, higher levels of PFOA. Again, there's 30 people, but we did see elevated levels of PFOS. So, um, I don't know where we are now. It's like, so, um, so Riverwatch has been really involved in the report back, holding community meetings, advertising, reviewing letters, moderating meetings, because, uh, I think it's really critical for us to have someone from the community be the moderator and help kind of balance the expectations of the audience with what we know and can talk about um, and then provide follow up. So where are we now? Um, so science, we have the data in hand. We're interacting with the community, all sorts of community. So our community, when you start to share data, then there's a lot of new partners you have like the public health department, EPA, ATSER, everybody wants to know what you're gonna say before you tell anybody. So how do you manage that? Um, we had a webinar and allowed people to participate. Um, we're doing more communication efforts. Um, and then, I don't know if you have, we have, um, you have anything? Yeah, we, it, you know, this, is, this has been a, a wake up call for our community about how safe our water is, what's in our water, and, and what we can learn about how what's in our water impacts our health. You know, from, from the advocacy, from the organizational perspective, you know, there's been a fair amount of work done 
uh, legal work done and policy work done. Um, and, but, you know, but we're still very much community is, is still very much waiting to see kind of what the final answers are and, and how this impact is we're waiting to find out, you know, what the state is able to do, what these lawsuits are able to do. Um, but overall, definitely more awareness in the community that, that we've got to you know, be more careful uh, about our water supply. And we've got to, we've got to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect it. All right, so and I'll just end with this, like, how has our partnership changed? Like, uh, now, uh, myself or other members of our center are presenting at community meetings. Kemp is going to be on a community panel of a symposium that our center is hosting. So a lot more kind of really formal interaction um, uh, that w our collaboration has given the people in Wilmington access to scientists to ask questions or help respond. And there's better information sharing in both directions. Like, what'd you learn from the permit? What does this paper say? Um, and that, um, so scientists, we're also spending more time communicating results to diverse populations. And that we're looking forward to working together in the future. We have a big team. Um, and, Here's the last. Okay. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our guests today for uh, <laughs> yeah, just a few minutes left, and I want to make sure we have some time for questions from this audience. And I'm hoping that those of you who are listening in on the webinar will also have a chance to send in a couple of uh, your questions. So, questions um, from the audience. Thank you very much for this presentation. Exciting work. Thank you for this really very interesting and timely uh, presentation. Appreciate it. Um, when you were talking about recruiting your um, population, and you mentioned that the African American community wasn't responding, did that tell you that you were you reaching their particular questions, or was there a trust issue? What was really going on there? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I think I think that, um, and this is just my opinion, is I think that. They want to, this is like a, uh, that there's more like circumspection, like who are these people? What are they going to do? Why are they studying us? And so there was just more time needed to make that connection. Um, and does that make sense? Does yeah, that seem to I be? Going to that health fair, going to a health fair that was kind of sponsored by NAACP, Kind of created a, a space that there was a lot more kind of trust there, and, and you know, NAACP was kind of making that introduction. Yeah, and and I do feel like so we've gone and uh, we've gone to NAACP meetings to share results um, and to talk about the study, and you can see that there's a different level of engagement on this topic in the community. So I do think when you're trying to recruit. Um, underrepresented people, if you can figure out how to go to them, um, you'll be, you'll do better. Um, no, we didn't go through the faith community, though um, the, the president of the NAACP is pretty active in that. So, um, and, and again, part of it is like, how, how you're moving fast and so how do you make these connections and so um i think that maybe we would do things differently but now we have our foot in the door we're submitting a super fund grant i have letters of support from the naacp we've been on local naacp sponsored radio um we're a known quantity now and i think that's the challenge when you're moving fast is that you are not a known quantity and NC State is like two and a half hours from Wilmington. So, um, you know, who are these people? So I think part part of that is like, it's hard to build that connection quickly. I'll just follow up. Now, it, it, we didn't necessarily formally go through uh, religious institutions, but, but NAACP put, you know, we went to NAACP and NAACP went to a number of churches, so the larger churches in our area. Uh, African Americans and, and got the word out that way. So it 
wasn't that we were going to the church and studying the Bible. Thank you both. I, I was curious how you mentioned that there was no Gen X. Substances measured in human bio samples. And for her floral substances, is there a converging metabolic byproduct the same way there is in trees? So that there might be a common compound that they degrade to in the body? Or There's no. These seem to be so environmentally persist, persistent because the, all the flooring groups, they're not going anywhere. And so they don't seem to be breaking down. And so given what we knew from animal studies, five months later might have been too late. Um, we are trying to get stored serum samples from before people knew about this. So people who are controls in ca cancer case control studies who lived in Wilmington, do they have Gen X in their body? So we maybe there's some historic, or maybe it's maybe because it's an ether, it's more likely to be found in urine. Uh, we don't know. So yeah, so this is also the challenge of communicating. It's like every answer, every question we're asked is like, well, we don't know, uh, you know. And so how do you, how do you engender trust and have people think that you? are the person who might be able to help them figure out it when every time you say, well, I don't know. Like, so, um, but I think we work really hard to kind of balance that um, and work to create more literacy about the topic. All right, please join me in thanking Jane and Kat for traveling up here. And